This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com um, One of the very interesting episodes in the Chumash is what we call the Dar HaFlaga, the generation that was dispersed. Where the Pasuk says, The Haya Kala Aretz Safa Achas The whole world was one language, which was referring to which language? Lashon HaKodesh, referring to Hebrew. The whole world spoke Hebrew, and then the Pasuk says, Udvarim Achadim, and they had a common purpose. The entire world, the entire settled world at that time came together for a common purpose. What was that common pur- purpose? Let's look in Rashi number 2. Udvarim Achadim, what were they getting together to do? The whole world came together to, for a common cause. What was it? it says Rashi, Ba'u Be'etza Achas, they came for one reason, for one counsel, v'amru, and they said, What right does God have to keep the heavens to Himself? God's up there in the heavens all by Himself. Nobody else is with Him. What right does He have to be all the way up there by Himself? Let's go up to the heavens, and we'll battle Him. So they decided they're going to go up to the heavens and battle Hashem. How are they going to get there? How are they getting up to the heavens? So for that we'll see. Then Rashi says another pshat. Davar acher, another pshat. What does it mean, dvarim achadim? For a common purpose. Al yechidoy shalalam, against the one being in the world. They were coming against Hashem. Dvarim achadim means they were coming against the one being. Davar acher, another pshat. We know that the great flood, the Mabal, happened 1,000 656 years into creation. In the year 1656, the heavens opened up, and it was, it was uh, a big flood. Okay? So they figured that this is some type of natural catastrophe, that every 1,656 years, the flood, the heavens open up. Sorry. So they figured this is going to happen again. So they have to do something about it. Every 1,656 years, the heavens fall down, so they have to make supports so that uh, the heavens don't fall down. They're going to make uh, pillars to hold up the heavens. Says Rashi, Dvarim achadim, Amru, they said, Achas le'elef v'taf reish nun vav shanim. Every 1,656 years, Harakia mismotet, the heavens start to sink. Keshem sha'asa b'mei ha'mabal, just like it happened in the days of the Mabal. Boyu venas eloi smuchais. Come, let us make supports for the heavens. So, very hard to understand what they're thinking. What, they're going to go up to the heavens and fight Hashem? I mean, how are they going to get there? And what are they going to do? They're going to fight Hashem? Well, these people were fools? So, the first thing we have to understand is, whatever it seems like it's happening on a superficial level, that's not what's happening. Whatever is happening over here, is beyond our comprehension. We can't understand this episode. Okay, look in the Ramban. The Ramban says in number three, kol ha-parsha hazu eno lefi Whatever is happening in this parsha is not the way we comprehend it. Don't try to understand things literally that this generation literally wanted to build a tower and go up and fight Hashem. Right? We know we can't do that. Certainly, they knew that they couldn't do that. You think they were fools? They weren't fools. Says the Ramban, Those who try to explain it, like it's simple meaning, like you know, we learned in kindergarten, that you know, they built a big tower, and they put brick on top of brick, and they wanted to go all the way over the clouds, over the moon, over the sun. That's not what's going on here. Whatever we learned when we were children... That's not the real explanation. Says the Ramban, Vehamefarshim Oisa Kipshut. If you want to explain this like the simple meaning, Kfar Bat Al Daitam, it's wrong. So it's not to be taken at first glance. That's the first thing we have to understand. What do these people want to build? Look at number one. Vayoimru, they said, Hava Nivna Lanu Ir. They said, first let's build a city. That's the first thing they wanted to do. They'll build a city. Umigdal, the second thing they wanted to do after they built the city is build a tower. The third thing they wanted is the Roshabashamayim, the head, the top of the tower should be in the heavens. And number four, Vinasa Lanushem, we want to make a name for ourselves. So they wanted to do four things. Number one, city. Number two, build a tower. 
Number three, the top of the tower should go into the heavens. And number four, they wanted to make a name for themselves. Okay. We're going to see that many of the Mepharsha, many of the commentaries actually understand that whatever they were trying to do here, this was some type of scientific experiment. And we're going to see that whatever their idea was, these are discoveries that were only made in this century. Okay? So even though it would seem that they're making some type of archaic uh, um, tower that, that it would seem only the cavemen would make. You know, you know, you have to be pretty unsophisticated to think you're going to actually climb up to the heavens. Actually, they had a deep scientific plan. And the first shot we're going to explain is Rabbeinu B'chayi. Rabbeinu B'chayi says like this, After God destroyed the world with a mabel, with a flood, what did Hashem promise? He promised He's never going to destroy the world again with water. Okay, so they figured, if Hashem's not going to destroy the world with water, maybe He'll destroy it with fire. So they had to come up with a way to save themselves from fire. Says Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar, an incredible thing. Sometimes fire comes down from the heaven, right? When? You ever, anyone ever see fire come down from the heaven? What happens all the time? It's called lightning, right? Lightning comes down from the heaven. What do we do? What has man invented to protect ourselves from lightning? Lightning rods. Lightning rods. It attracts the lightning to designated places so it doesn't go elsewhere. That's what the tower was. It was a big lightning rod. They knew God can't destroy the world with water. He could only destroy it with fire. They constructed some type of magnetic tower that any fire that would come down from heaven would go to the tower and leave them alone. That's what Abinu B'chai says. So, you know, if somebody asks, what was the first lightning rod in history? The tower. That's How many years ago was this? This was about 20... Um, 1656, about 4,000 years ago. Yeah. About I mean, four. In 1656. Yeah. Okay. Before Edison. Before this is before Edison. It's before lightning rods. Yeah. So before electricity. The way they wanted to establish their name across the land. Yeah, that was the way. You know, you build a big tower and you name it at. This way, people would. Through scientific merit, of, uh, in a way. Yeah, it, they, maybe they would win the Nobel Prize for the of the time. Famous. Yeah, and they'll become famous. Everyone will know this is the, the first uh, fire drawing tower in history. That, that's what they were doing. So it's not that they wanted to climb up a tower and fight it. So what does it mean they wanted to fight Hashem? Well, they knew that Hashem might want to destroy them. So this was a way to protect themselves from Hashem's wrath. So in that sense, they were fighting Hashem. Hashem had a plan and they were counteracting the plan. In that sense, they were fighting Hashem's plan. Okay. Let's take a look at that in number four, Rabbeinu B'chai, and then you're going to see something that's really mind-boggling. V'yadarech ha-seichel, to take a logical approach, v'nas alanu shem, what does it mean they wanted to make a name for themselves? Hayu anshe ha-flaga rishayim, the men of the dispersion were wicked. Maskilim b'chal chachma, they were wise with all disciplines of wisdom. Fa'asu ha'ir v'hamigdal, they made the city and the tower k'day lihi natsel mehamabul shalish to save themselves from a mabul of fire. Mibnei shekfaro avadin ha'olam b'mabul shomayim. They saw the world was destroyed through water, so they knew Hashem promised He's not going to destroy the world for, through water anymore. So what's the next way? You know, not water. They figured fire. Pachdu l'nafshem, they were afraid. V'hutzruchu lasos binyan makom. And they wanted to make, to build a place, Shem Yirtzel, Lahavi Mabul Shalesh, that if God is going to bring a Mabul of fire, Velisso Fasa Olam, Sheyinasul Mehem, they'll be saved. Velo Sikrav Haesh Begvulam, and the fire will not enter their boundaries. Vezehu Inyan Hamachama Hamuska Bemedrash. That's what it means that they wanted to fight Hashem. They were going to counteract Hashem's plan. Kalomar, as if to say, Lehe Azer Ema Kochos Yonim. They were going to counteract the will of Hashem. It doesn't mean they were going to take a sword and chas v'shalom, fight Hashem with the sword. It means Hashem had a certain plan. They were counteracting it. So that was a way of fighting Hashem's plan. And he goes on to explain, you know, how do you make a lightning rod? If the, I don't know if this is how they make lightning rods, but their idea was that if this tower somehow had elements of fire in its construction, it would attract the fire from heaven. That's his job. Another pshat, listen to this. If 
if you were going to build a tower that goes all the way up to the heavens, the base of the tower would have to be bigger than this world. You can't, if you really want to make a tower that goes high enough all the way, you know, up to the moon, the tower is going to be higher than this world. Says Rabbi Yonis and Ibeshitz, but there's a way to get up to the heavens without making a tower. How do they get up to the heavens nowadays? Spaceship. Spaceship! That's what they were making. They were making a satellite spaceship. Look at, look at the words he says. Rabbi Yonis and Ibeshitz, 1700s, okay? So now somebody asks you, what was the first spaceship? This tower. It was some type of tower that somehow would blast them because they realized, you know, the matter, there's a matter that says, you know, they shot arrows up, they kept on shooting, and at one point the arrows didn't come down. So they figured there must be some area in space where gravity works the other way. So they figured they don't have to build a tower all the way up to the heavens, they just have to get to the point where gravity is going to be pulling them upward. So they figured they'll fly through this rocket ship that they're creating above the point of gravity, and then gravity will take them in the other direction. That's another explanation for what they were doing. It says, Rabbeinu Yonas and Ibeshitz, the Sifro Tifaras Yonas, and Rabbi Yonas and Ibeshitz, one of the greatest proliferators of Torah of all time. He taught and throughout his career over 24,000 students. He says, Roeb the Migdal, he sees in the tower, Cain, a base, Ubasis, and a support, Lekli Neshek. What's Neshek? Weapon. Weapon. Right? You go to Israel, you have Yesha Neshek? You have any weapons on you? They're making a weapon. Kari Teal. What's a Teal? Bivrit? A Teal? It's a missile. A missile. A missile. In English, not a missile. A Teal is a missile. A Teal, yeah. Sheba Ezra. So they're going to cop aboard this missile. Sheba Ezra. So they'll get to the moon and they figured on the moon there are no marbles, there are no fires everything is safe on the moon there are no taxes, no problems on the moon okay but I would like to focus primarily on the pshat yes you just said the moon did they think that Hashem was in the moon? so they figured at least they'll be safe on the moon Whatever, whatever catastrophes happen down here on Earth, you know, like nowadays they're talking, you know, global warming and all that, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start settlements on the moon, we'll be spared of all these things. So, these were the earliest, uh, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, there was no Jewish people yet. These were the descendants of Noah, who after a, few, a couple generations, they forgot about how Hashem saved their ancestor. And they uh, got too comfortable in this world. They wanted to rebel. People? People. People. Man, this, mankind. How many of them? Millions? It's unclear. It doesn't say in the Chumash. We don't know. Now we do know that some... There was a man by the name of Ashur. Did not want his children partaking in this tower. So he took them aside. And you know what city he built? The city of Ninveh. Sound familiar? What was the city of Nineveh? That's the city that Yonah went to to tell them to do tshuva. The question is, since when does God send prophets to the Goyim to do tshuva? Hashem doesn't care if the Goyim do tshuva. Hashem never in history sent any prophet to the Goyim to tell them to do tshuva except for Nineveh. Why were they selected? One of the reasons is, is because the founder of their city was a man by the name of Ashur, and he founded it, L'shem Shamayim, for the sake of heaven, so that his children should not go along with this idea. And therefore, Hashem had a, he, they had special favor in the eyes of Hashem, and Hashem allowed them to have the access to a prophet. Okay. Now we're going to explore an incredible idea. Okay? And this is really a very novel approach in what exactly is going on over here, what these people were constructing. We know, and there's a Pasuk in Kohelas. Pasuk in Kohelas says, Ze le'umas ze asa eloikim. <coughs> God created one thing opposite the other. Which means that in this world, there are, will never be only opportunities to do good, or only places to do good, or only people who represent goodness. Whatever there is good in this world, there has to be bad corresponding to it. Because if there isn't, there's no free choice. If there are only good places to go to, good people to influence you, 
good friends to influence you, then there's no free choice. Whatever there is good in this world, there is corresponding bad. That's the way the world is set up. Wherever you are, whoever you are, there is good in this world, there's bad in this world. And therefore the people said like this, if there is a place in this world that Hashem's Shechina, Hashem's Divine Presence is found, namely Yerushalayim, and if there is a place specifically where Hashem's Divine Presence is found, which is the Beis HaMikdash, and if the Beis HaMikdash is like the tunnel to the heavens through which Hashem answers prayer and Hashem brings Kedusha to this world, there has to be a corresponding place of Tumah of evil. So they figured, if there is a city called Yerushalayim, let us build a city to bring Tumah to the world. The city that they wanted to build, the ear that they were referring to, was a direct counterbalance to Yerushalayim. There's a city of Kedusha, a city of holiness, Yerushalayim, we're going to make an ear of Tumah, an ear of impurity. There's a Beis HaMikdash, that is a place where Hashem's Shechina is found. We will make a place in this world, a city, a tower, corresponding to the Beis HaMikdash, that promulgates, that spreads Tumah, that spreads impurity, that spreads false ideologies. That was the Migdal. The city corresponded to Yerushalayim. The Migdal corresponded to the Beis HaMikdash. What does it mean, Verosho Bashamayim, that its head goes to the heavens? What is the Beis HaMikdash? Beis HaMikdash is, is a porthole. It's, a, it's like a straight uh, conduit to the heavens. We daven, the tefillos go straight up when you're at the Beis HaMikdash. Hashem sends the bracha straight down. That's what the Beis HaMikdash is, a straight conduit to Kedusha. They figured if that exists for good, we're going to make something for bad. We're going to make a direct conduit to Tumah. We're going to make a city counteracting Yerushalayim. We're going to make a Migdal, a tower counteracting the base of Mikdash, and its head, its top, will be directly opposite whatever angel brings Tumah to the world. Because the rule is, if there is good in this world, there has to be an equal amount of bad. Whatever you see a shul, you should know there's some place in this world that is... As good as this is, there must be a place as bad. Okay? That's the way the world is. But in this case, wouldn't the bad have preceded the good? Well, why? The base of didn't exist. But, but, we're going to see that when Noah came out of the Teva before this, right? What was the fr- Where did his Teva land? Anyone remember? Ararat. Not Ararat. Right. Hari Ararat. Where is that? Turkey, isn't it? Probably in Turkey. But then it says he brought a carbon. He, Noach offered a sacrifice. And the Gemara says, where did he offer the sacrifice? On the Makom HaMikdash, where Adam was created, where Avraham would later bring okay. Yitzchak at, um, for the Akedah. So Noach recognized already the place of the Beis HaMikdash as a place of special Kedusha. So even though technically there was no Yerushalayim, there was no Beis HaMikdash, but it was recognized as a holy city and as a holy place. And they felt, since such a place exists in this world, there must be a corresponding place of badness in this world also. Okay, let's take a look at this inside a little bit. Look at number six. This is the explanation of the Nesivas. The Nesivas, you know, David, right, in Yeshiva, the, who the, always argues, the Ktsois and the Nesivas. They're always a uh, big machlek is between the Ktsois and the Nesivas. Nesivas wrote uh, many commentaries. He wrote um, the Chavos Das on Yoradeo. He wrote the Taras Kitten. He wrote the Beis Yaakov. And he wrote a parish on Chumash, Nachlas Yaakov. Okay? Take a look on the fifth line. See, on the fifth line, the second word, where he says, V'yadua. It is known. Okay? And get this Pasuk. Ki zeh God made one thing corresponding to another. V'hinei. Just like there is in the world a place where Kedusha settles, just like David Amal said, Ad until I find a place for Hashem. Even though you would think, what do you mean there's a place where Hashem is? Hashem, Uncle Moshe already paskened. Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is truly everywhere, right? We, but still, still, even though Hashem is everywhere, there are places where Hashem is more found. So if there are places where Hashem is more found, he said, that I knew from a different tape. <laughs> but um, there have to be places where Tumah is found. 
Yerushalayim, just like there are, you need to prepare holy places like Yerushalayim. It's not just Yerushalayim was a holy place, but it had to be built up for Hashem to go there. Ubeis Hamikdash, the Beis Hamikdash had to be built up for Hashem to rest there. Shehem Muchanim Neged Shar Hashemayim, which are corresponding to the gates of heavens. La Hashras Kedusha, Kamokein Chas V'Shalom, So too Tsarich La Hashras Tuma. You need to make places for Tuma. So they figured we are going to designate a city. This will be Sin City. You know, there was a first. Uh, First sin city. And this is going to be a really bad place. This Migdal is going to be a Makom Tumah. Lekach Tzrichen Livnos Ir U Migdal. Therefore they needed to make a city and a tower. Leham Shech Shefa Mishar HaTumah. To draw Tumah from... If there's a place in this world that brings down Kedusha, there's also a place that brings down Tumah. The Yadua... And everybody knows, Kibamakam Hashra Satuma, in a place where Tuma settles, Borachas Hakdusha. Kedusha flees. Kiyal Yedei Shachatu, because if they would sin there, Nestalka Hashkina Adorakia Hashvi, the Shkina would depart all the way up to the seventh heaven. Velazar Ratsu Lehashros Hatuma Ba'aretz. They wanted that the Tuma, the impurity, should settle in the land. Va'asu Kavanim Lemlachas Hashemayim. They therefore made signals. This tower is like a signal to the heavens, va'aretz and the land, lehamshich tuma ba'aretz to draw tuma in the land, ulehesiachid atzman b'kochas atuma to designate themselves with these evil forces, bebinyan ear by building a city, umigdal and a tower. Now, this just these last couple words, ear neged Yerushalayim, the city corresponded to Yerushalayim, umigdal neged beis hamikdash. This tower corresponded to the beis hamikdash. This same Nesivos uses this idea to explain a very difficult thing. We know that there was once a man named Haman, right? What did Haman want to do? The Kill the Jews. So what does he do? He goes to Achashverosh. He says, Achashverosh, I'll pay you. He says, here are 10,000 talents of silver. Asaras alafim kikar kasef. I want to buy the right to kill the Jews. The Gemara in the Yushami makes a calculation that 10,000 talents of silver is the equivalent of a machzis hashekel, a half a shekel for all 600,000 Jews. So Haman somehow knew that to kill the Jews he was going to have to pay a machzis hashekel, a half a shekel corresponding to each Jew. In fact, the Gemara tells us that Hashem knew that Haman was eventually going to pay, right, David, we learned the Megillah, the Adav Tezayin, that Haman was going to pay a half a shekel to, uh, for each Jew to be able to kill them. So Hashem said, Haman, don't think you're the first one to pay. The Jews already donated a half a shekel to the Beis HaMikdash, and they counteracted you. They ca- so what's going on here? Haman, it seems like the fact that Haman paid a half a shekel to be able to kill the Jews was some type of merit for Haman that Hashem had to tell him, no, don't worry, you don't have any zechus, you don't have any merit. The Jews have already donated a machzah shekel before you to the Beis HaMikdash so you don't have any special mitzvah for paying to kill them. What? what? No, he didn't. It means like in heaven, Hashem was sort of laughing. Haman, you think you're a big guy that you're paying to kill the Jews? The Jews already paid a half a shekel to the Beis HaMikdash. So they preempted you. But what, Haman was getting some type of mitzvah by giving, paying a half a shekel to kill the Jews? Why did Hashem need to counteract Haman's... What was, what kind, Haman was doing a bad thing by paying to kill the Jews. Why did Hashem have to counteract him? You hear the question? Here... It almost seems like Haman had a zechus of paying a half a shekel for each Jew to kill them, and Hashem had to somehow give us the mitzvah first to counteract him. Says the Nesivos, yeah. Because how did the Jews build the Beis HaMikdash? Through what? They, every Jew gave a half a shekel to build the Beis HaMikdash. So what does that mean? You could create Kedusha through each Jew giving a half a shekel. So Haman thought to himself, if you're able to create Kedusha by giving a half a shekel, then the way of the world is, anything that could be done for good, could be done for bad. He figured if he gives a half a shekel for each Jew, 
he will be able to summon the forces of Tuma and destroy the Jews. Because the rule is, If you're able to accomplish something in Kedusha, there has to be something equivalent to that in evil that could also be accomplished. So therefore, Hashem had to give us the mitzvah of Machsas Hasheka to counterbalance what Haman was going to do. Because the rule is, anything, anytime you could accomplish something in Kedusha, in holiness, in goodness, there has to be something in this world of equal value in badness that gives you free choice. So now we come to something that Oren asked a very long time ago. He may have forgot. He asked me about demons, right? Ghosts. 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 Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about ghosts. Okay, but don't worry, I hope everyone will be able to sleep tonight. There are no ghosts under your pillows, under your bed, don't worry, none in the closet. Here's the question. The question is, anybody here know anyone who could do black magic or witchcraft? It doesn't really exist anymore. Even though you read in the Chumash and Mitzrayim, these guys were all big magicians, you know. They could turn the water, the Egyptian magicians, they could turn the water into blood and they could, all kinds of tricks. They could turn the stick into a snake, all kinds of different uh, cool things. And nowadays, you know, maybe you, know, you could pull a rabbit out of your hat, but there's no more black magic. You read the Gemara, the Gemara is full of stories about Shadim. Shadim are demons. The Gemara talks about they were demons. You know, these spiritual creatures, they weren't human beings, they were some type of angelic, spiritual beings that wreaked havoc. Anyone here ever see a shade? You don't see them. The Gemara is full of stories about Shadim. What happened to them? You know, they, they went extinct? What happened to them? Or, you know, you read these stories how in Europe you had people that a Dibbuk went into them, right? You have a, they were taken over by a Dibbuk. You ever hear that? Awesome. A, a Dibbuk. And, and uh, they couldn't talk anymore. The Dibbuk spoke out of their throat and they were completely meshuggah because... Uh, and then the big tzaddik came along and... What's the word? Exercise? The... the Exercise the demon, right? Well, anyone ever see them in America? You ever hear, you know, you ever come, come walk the streets one day, you see somebody, you know, with, with a dibbik in them? Well, even Catholics have to talk about exorcisms. Yeah, but why don't we see it anymore? What happened to them? What, what, they, all just, they all went extinct. No more shadim, no more black magic. All the fun things, they're, they're gone, they're disappeared. What happened? Why did they go away? Says of Yaakov Kamenetsky, unbelievable thing. In this world, it's ze leuma ze. Everything in Kedusha has a counterbalance. So what happens? Moshe Rabbeinu goes down to Mitzrayim and he starts performing miracles, open miracles. So it's clear there must be a God. How in the world is this man turning water into blood? How is he turning the dirt into the water into frogs? There must be a God in this world. That would remove everybody's free choice. If a prophet is performing open miracles, then how could you not believe in Hashem? Well, you'll say, what do you mean? You'll, you could be stubborn. But it doesn't matter. Even a stubborn person needs to rationalize the miracle in some way. He has to come up with some type of explanation for it. So therefore Hashem says, since I want this world to be there to be availability of free choice, if I'm going to allow the prophets to perform miracles, if there are going to be open miracles in this world, there has to be forces of evil that could also change nature. There has to be black magic. There has to be kishof. There has to be demons. Because if the forces of Kedusha openly could change this world, the physical world, then the forces of evil also have to be able to. Otherwise, Nobody would ever have free choice. If it's clear that there's a God in the world because the tzaddikim could change nature, then everyone will believe in Hashem. So Hashem said, we're not going to make it so apparent. We're not going to let... We're not going to make it so clear there's a God. We'll let people rationalize. Maybe when Moshe Rabbeinu turns the water into blood, he's doing it through black magic. Maybe he's doing it through kishuf. Maybe he summoned the shadim to do it. Even when Hashem split the sea, remember... On the seventh day of Pesach, Hashem split the sea. What does the Pasuk say? The Hashem. The Pasuk says. 
there was a Ruach Kadim Aza Kalala, there was a very strong east wind. Why? Because Hashem, you're right, Hashem's splitting the sea, so now the whole world is going to see Hashem takes the mighty river and causes it to stop mid flow. So there's a God in the world. No, so what does Hashem do? He makes a very strong wind. This way people could say, ah, you know what happened? There was a big uh, tornado. There was a big, a strong wind. There was a, a twister. And it, and it caused the sea to split. This way people could rationalize it. Because in this world, God never makes things simple. Nothing will ever be clear. God doesn't want there to be a removal of free choice. If there's no free choice, then we can't be rewarded. The only reason we're rewarded for any mitzvah is because it's difficult to choose the right path. Because you could choose the right way, you could choose the wrong way. And if there's no kishof, then ha- people will obviously see a miracle and they'll have to say it's Hashem. So, so long as Kedusha... You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.